The gently rolling green landscape of the Soma is no longer recognizable. It's become a wasteland, the long grass dotted with craters, barbed wire, and trenches. For the last several days, the British Army has unleashed a methodical barrage of artillery on German trenches and positions, aiming to decimate enemy forces before the ground war starts. On July 1, 1916, at 7.30 am, the Anglo-French armies attack. Private William Cyril Josie is in the very first wave of men to go over the top of the trenches. It's a chaotic bloodbath. The British artillery has not destroyed the Germans as hoped. German snipers and machine gunners unleash a hailstorm of bullets on the charging soldiers. Less than 20 minutes into battle, Cyril is wounded. He's shot in the chest and left shoulder. Two comrades grab Cyril's field pack. They rip open his uniform and drench Cyril's wounds with iodine. They help Cyril press dressing into his chest, trying to staunch the blood. However, in minutes his bandages are soaked through. In the mayhem, he's left for dead near the German wire. Private Cyril Josie is only 16 years old. He spends the next few hours drifting in and out of consciousness. Eventually, he goes beyond fear and reaches a calm state of mind, thinking that he might survive. It's a cloudless, hot summer day and Cyril's thirsty. Agonizingly slow, Cyril reaches for his water bottle. He dares not move too fast. He doesn't want to alert the Germans that he's still alive. It's many long minutes before Cyril is able to move the water bottle to his mouth and take a sip. The day wears on. When Cyril runs out of water, he slowly retrieves the water bottles of fallen comrades who lie near him. Night falls. The stench of death hangs heavy in the air. By now, the battlefield is covered in thousands of dead and dying soldiers. German patrols search among the fallen, taking wounded men prisoner. Cyril lies, clutching a grenade, ready at any moment to pull the pin with his teeth. Around 7 a.m. the next day, almost 24 hours after he was wounded, Cyril thinks it's safe enough to move. He begins a long, painful crawl on his belly through the grass back toward the British trenches. His activity causes his wounds to bleed afresh. During the excruciating, hazardous journey, Cyril runs into Private Lamacraft, who is also badly wounded but still clinging to life. For an hour, they crawl together but make little progress. Both soldiers are weak and suffering from blood loss. Worse yet, the Germans see them moving and start shooting at them. Cyril is in slightly better physical shape, and they decide that he should go on alone. Cyril spends precious time gathering nearby water bottles for Lamacraft. Then he continues on, stiffly and painfully creeping through the grass, detouring around the dead and avoiding craters. During part of his crawl, the land slopes upward and frequently Cyril has to stop to rest. To quote Cyril, an eternity later, he finally reaches the British lines. Mustering all his strength, Cyril struggles to his feet and quickly throws himself into a trench. When he regains consciousness, two officers are trying to make him drink rum. It's taken him nearly two days to crawl about a quarter of a mile. Cyril begs that they send someone to rescue Lamy, but it's far too dangerous. However, Private Lamacraft is found alive three days later, most likely sustained by the water Cyril provided. Cyril is medically evacuated from the Soma and spends nearly six months in the hospital recuperating. Cyril isn't the only underage British soldier at the Battle of Soma. Although the official age to join the military in Britain is 18, a soldier must be 19 to be shipped overseas. An estimated 250,000 boys enlisted into the British forces during World War I. Cyril actually signed up when he was 15 years old. The youngest known British World War I soldier was 12. Wait a minute, didn't recruiters notice that some of those enlisting looked suspiciously young? During the early 20th century, many people didn't have birth certificates, and it was a lot easier to lie about age. For recruits, Britain had a minimum height requirement of 5 foot 3 inches and a minimum chest size of 34 inches. Often, if a young man met the physical criteria, recruiters ignored the fact that he was baby-faced. Besides, patriot fervor reigned in the country. Government propaganda pushed fighting for Britain as a glorious adventure. In some areas, peer pressure was strong and groups of boys would join up together. Some enlisted to escape poverty, unemployment, or difficult home situations. Also, when World War I broke out, the standing German army was over three times bigger than the standing British army. A large number of soldiers needed to be mobilized as quickly as possible. If a healthy young lad was eager to go off to fight, recruiters weren't going to say no. The bounty recruiters were paid didn't hurt either. Recruiters earned two shillings and six pence for each new army recruit, or about six pounds or seven dollars and eighty-five cents US in today's money. Fourteen-year-old Reginald St. John Battersby ran away from home, enlisted in the army, and was promoted to Lance Corporal within a week. When his father, a vicar near Manchester, found out, he was upset. Given their social standing in the community, he thought that his son deserved a higher position. 
He sought support from the Lord Mayor of Manchester and the headmaster of Middleton Grammar School, where St. John had been a pupil. They provided letters of reference to authorities regarding St. John's leadership qualities. And so St. John was commissioned as an officer in the East Lancashire Regiment, becoming the youngest known commissioned officer of the British Army during World War I. Not long after, he was stationed near Serre in the Somme region and placed in charge of a 60-man platoon, some of whom were a decade or more older than him. During the first day of the Somme Offensive on July 1, 1916, St. John was severely wounded by German machine gun fire. As a result, he was medically evacuated to England. Three months later, St. John had recovered from his wounds and was back at the Somme, leading his men into battle. St. John actually could have made the choice to stay in England. Parents of young soldiers, alarmed by newspaper reports of deaths, had lobbied the British government. By 1916, the government bowed to public pressure and removed soldiers younger than 19 from the front lines. However, experienced officers were in short supply, and young officers such as St. John were allowed the option to stay if they wished. The underage soldiers were sent to special camps where they remained until they turned 19 years old, and then they could return to fighting. Some were glad to be away from battle, but others weren't fans of the young soldier camps. Battle-hardened teens, some of whom had responsibilities far beyond their years, some even having earned military medals for their heroic actions, balked at being treated like boys again. Some of the younger soldiers, completely disillusioned by the reality of war, took their own lives rather than return to the front lines. Private Cyril was shipped to a young soldier's camp. In the summer of 1918, when he was old enough to fight again, he returned to France. Cyril fought in the Hundred Days Offensive. He ended up surviving the war but came home changed. For the rest of his life, he became anti-authority. Compelled by a sense of duty, St. John returned to the front line and spent his next few months fighting in the trenches. On March 7, 1916, 16-year-old St. John and a few of his men were standing under a bridge across the British trenches when they were hit by a German shell. Several soldiers were killed. A piece of shrapnel mangled St. John's leg and it had to be amputated. He was evacuated to England again to convalesce. Though asked to resign his commission, St. John was determined to continue to aid the war effort. He got a prosthetic leg and was declared fit for duty on March 13, 1918. Soon after he returned to service, St. John joined the Royal Engineers Record Office Transportation Branch and worked an administrative job in Britain until September 1920 when he resigned his commission. St. John then studied theology in college and eventually became a vicar of a small rural parish like his father. As World War I raged overseas, the women of Britain stepped up to take over jobs traditionally done by men. Often it was teenage girls who took on various jobs to help support their families and the war effort. Organizations sprang up to manage and support the young women taking on new duties. The Women's Land Army, or WLA, was a civilian organization created in 1915 by the British Board of Agriculture. The land girls, or women who worked for the WLA, harvested crops and performed other farm-related tasks. The Canary Girls worked in munitions, manufacturing TNT. They gained the nickname because exposure to TNT was toxic and repeated exposure turned their skin an orange-yellow color. The Voluntary Aid Detachment, or VAD, was a civilian nursing unit that provided medical care for military personnel. As the war wore on, young VAD nurses were dispatched to work in the field hospitals. Teenage girls as young as 17, who had only completed basic training, were required to treat horrific war wounds and deal with death while under constant threat of attack from the enemy. While it's likely that during World War I, Britain had the most soldiers under 18 years of age, all the countries at war had underage soldiers enlisted among their ranks. Eight-year-old Momchilo Gavric of Serbia was the youngest soldier to fight in World War I. He was born into a large family, the eighth child out of eleven. The Gavriches lived in the small village of Trubznica in the western region of the country. In August 1914, Austro-Hungarian soldiers of the 42nd Croatian Home Guard Infantry Division murdered Momchilo's parents, grandmother, and three sisters, and four of his brothers. The invading soldiers also burned his home to the ground. Momchilo survived because he wasn't at home when the attack happened. His father, anticipating trouble, had sent him to his uncles. Momchilo returned home to a horrific scene which was burned into his mind for the rest of his life. With most of his family dead and nowhere to live, Momchilo ran to a nearby town where the 6th Artillery Division of the Serbian Army was stationed. Upon hearing Momchilo's tragic news, Major Stefan Tukovic accepted him into his unit. 
Another soldier in the unit, Milos Misovic, was assigned to look after Momchilo. The same evening, Momchilo took revenge by going on a scouting mission with Milos and showing the Serbian army the location of the Austro-Hungarian soldiers. He also participated in the subsequent bombardment of the invaders. After the Battle of Cher, when Momchilo was eight, he was promoted to the rank of corporal and given a military uniform. During the War of 1914, Momchilo fought along his unit at the Battle of Kolubara. In early 1915, when the Serbian army crossed the snow-covered Albanian mountains, Momchilo marched right alongside the rest of the soldiers. When his unit was sent to Thessaloniki in Greece, Major Tukovic sent Momchilo to a safe small town in Macedonia, where he quickly went through the equivalent of four years of elementary school, crammed into several months. Later, Momchilo was wounded during the Battle of Kaimakshalon. At 10 years old, he was promoted to Lance Sergeant. After the liberation of Belgrade in 1918, Major Tukovic helped Momcilo receive aid from a British mission that was helping war orphans in Serbia. Momcilo was sent to England for high school. In 1921, after graduating at age 15, Momcilo returned to Serbia per the orders of Serbian Prime Minister, who wanted all the war orphans to return home. He was reunited with his three older brothers who had already left home before the family massacre of 1914. In 1929, 23-year-old Momcilo was conscripted to the army. He had reported that he had already served in the army during World War I and had been wounded and had even received an Albanian commemorative medal. An ethnic Croat officer in the Royal Yugoslav Army tried to force Momcilo into signing a confession that he was lying about his World War I service. Momcilo refused to sign and ended up serving two months in jail. After another stint in the army, Momcilo worked as a graphic designer and got married. Years later, he was called up and served in World War II. Momcilo ended up being captured twice by German occupying forces. It's hard to estimate how many underage soldiers were killed while serving in World War I. For those lucky enough to return home, the horror of what they saw and experienced often haunted them for the rest of their lives. Sadly, underage soldiers are not just a phenomenon that happened in the past. Today, thousands of children around the world are forced into a war or forced to serve as menial or slave labor to support fighters. The United Nations Children's Fund, or UNICEF, and other organizations continue to work to improve the plight of child soldiers and remove those under 18 from fighting wars altogether. How and why did World War I start? You can find out here. During World War I, a new kind of fighting machine was created, the tank. However, it took a while to work out some kinks in the design. Check out the story of Little Willie, the most useless tank ever made, here.